Hi everyone, welcome back to another Planetarium live stream. Uh, my name is Jessica, I am the director of the Planetarium, and with me tonight is a familiar face if you've been here before, but I'll still let him introduce himself. Hi, my name is Eli, I'm a physics and astronomy undergraduate student at UMB. So tonight, we hope you are ready for a little bit of spooks, because that is exactly what we're going to be doing, talking about some of the spooky star stories that we can find up in our nighttime sky. So I'm going to get everything switched over. Um, while I'm doing that, if you do have any questions for us throughout the show tonight, just leave them down in the comments. Eli is going to be watching that for me and will let me know if any questions do pop up. But with that, let's get started. So to tell our star stories tonight, we are going to be using a program called Stellarium. If you've been to one of our star story shows in the past, um, one of our star story live streams, then uh, you'll know this is what we've been using. And it is actually completely free to download. There's a link to it in the video description. All right. Let's get into this. If you're brave enough, turn off the lights. Otherwise, uh, get settled in because we're about to get a little spooky here. And we are going to start off with this beautiful cloud-like structure we see in our nighttime sky that is currently up in kind of the south-southwest. Now, those of you may know that this is our Milky Way galaxy, the galaxy that we live in. And it makes this beautiful kind of hazy, cloudy stripe across the sky. And it's very apparent if you are in dark enough skies. It, it'll be very obvious. You'll see it stretching across the sky. And so it's no wonder that there are a lot of cultures that have stories around the Milky Way, what it is, how it formed, all of that sort of stuff. And a lot of them do actually center around the Milky Way being the road that the dead take to get to the afterlife. Uh, one of those cultures is the Apache. So, um, Yonke Nalan is the name of the most feared and venerated deities in the Apache mythology. She is the goddess of death and the afterlife. She controls all souls that pass on to the future world. The road to this afterworld is supposed to cross her shoulders and is symbolized by the Milky Way, which is a trail made by the departing spirits. The souls of the dead follow the path for four days and finally arrive in a land of peace and plenty where there is no disease or death. Similarly, the Pawnee also see the Milky Way as kind of the pathway of the departed spirits. Um, we have uh, several uh, Pawnee constellations that kind of tie into this, um, including um, a couple of men carrying a dead man on a stretcher. Um, we think that Polaris, the North Star, uh, acts as kind of their gatekeeper and a guidepost to guide the spirits on their path across the Milky Way. Uh, so that's just a few of those, but this is a very common story, is the Milky Way being the kind of path of the dead. Now we're going to make our way around to the north. Uh, here's that North Star that I just was talking about. And there is another story about the North Star that comes to us from the Arabic culture. They see the North Star here as al Kabla, who is, according to Arabic mythology, um, this evil star that is staring down at the world through this hole in the sky. So al Kabla is evil because he killed a great warrior of the sky. And that warrior was buried in a coffin right next to him in what we typically think of as this pattern of stars known as the Big Dipper. This is the coffin where the great warrior sleeps. And so al Kabla is watching over everyone and is constantly being haunted by this great warrior that marches around him across the sky over the course of the night, night after night after night, while al Kabla stays there in the same spot watching motionless and cold forever. 
All right. We're going to turn back over to the west. Up in the west, we can see this. It looks like a U. Most of the time, it looks more like a C, but right now it looks like a U shape. This is the Greek constellation of Corona Borealis, or the Northern Crown. But to the Blackfoot, this actually represents the spider god sitting on his web. And the web is this grouping of stars right here. So here's the spider's web, and here is the spider. Sometimes he climbs down in the summer Milky Way to visit the Earth, though, and that's when the spider is kind of lower to the ground. So we have a giant spider up there, which definitely gives me the heebie-jeebies because I do not like spiders. Now this grouping of stars, that is the spider web to the uh, Blackfoot, to the Greeks, represents the hero Hercules. And so we have Hercules' body. He's kind of upside down. So here is his head, arm, arm, leg, leg. So he's kind of upside down right now. Um, and Hercules has quite a story to go along with him. So Hercules was um, tasked by the gods to complete these 12 labors. The reason for this, um, Hercules is the son of Zeus, the king of the gods, but uh, also his mom is a mortal woman, so he's kind of half god, half human, or demigod. Um, now, Hera, who is Zeus's wife, wanted to punish Hercules for being, you know, an illegitimate son of Zeus. And so at one point, she actually makes Hercules insane, and in his insanity, he accidentally kills his wife and his children. Now, he is completely distraught by this once he comes out of his insanity that was um, sparked on by Hera and her jealousy. Um, and he was ready to take some drastic action. But a good friend of his, Theseus, stopped him and made him talk to one of his friends. And the friend was the king of a local town. And so the friend told him that if he could complete these 12 impossible tasks, um, that he would be redeemed for killing his wife and children. And that is the 12 labors that Hercules had to complete. They included things like slaying the Nemean lion, which was this once thought of as unkillable lion, because the lion had this unpenetrable skin. You couldn't stab it with a sword or an arrow or anything. Which, by the way, once he was able to kill it, um, did not actually make him any more appealing because here you now have this guy who killed something that everyone thought was immortal. They actually made him even more scared of poor Hercules. Um, he had to slay the nine-headed Hydra. Um, he had to capture the golden stag of Artemis, capture the Arithmian boar, clean the Aegean stables, or sorry, Aegean stables in a single day, uh, slay the Symphalian birds, capture the Cretan bull, steal the mares of Diomedes, obtain the girdle of the Amazon warrior queen Hippolyte, obtain the cattle of the monster Garin, steal the apples of Hesperides, which were very strictly guarded by a 100-headed dragon, and then capture Cerberus, the guardian dog of Hades. So he had quite a feat in front of him and was able to complete all 12 of his tasks. So a kind of happy ending to this rather morbid starting off tale. All right. Um, if we now turn our attention over to the east, we have a pretty common or famous uh, grouping of stars in the sky. I would say second famous to the Big Dipper, and this is our big W here in the sky, which to the Greeks represents the Queen Cassiopeia. Um, but to the Arabic people, this is the Tinted Hand. Now, the Tinted Hand can represent either two things. 
a hand dyed red with henna, or, and what I think is a bit more fitting for this spooky story, uh, it is the bloodied hand of Fatima. Um, so Fatima liked to take things that weren't hers, and one day she was caught and brought before Muhammad, who decried that her hand should be cut off. A number of people tried to help her, but it did no good, and sure enough, Fatima's hand was cut off, and the dismembered hand, tinted with blood, is what they see as this grouping of stars, and as a warning to not take things that are not yours. Uh, now to the Yakima. This grouping of stars is known as the Elkskin. So there was once a family of five brothers. During autumn, the four oldest brothers decided to go elk hunting. They hiked a long ways out onto the prairie where they met a large man. This man convinced them that he could make the elk come quickly. So the brothers got ready for the hunt, and the man told him that he would help them by trading arrows with them, and the brothers agreed. The man, unfortunately, though, had tricked them, and he traded them his badly made arrows for their good ones before leaving. Once he was out of their sight, he changed into a huge elk and charged at the brothers, killing them. When the brothers didn't return home, the youngest brother went out to go look for them. He tracked them all the way out to where they had met the strange man who was waiting there for the youngest brother. The man tried to trick him too, just like he had tricked his brothers, but the youngest brother was not fooled. When the man disappeared, the youngest brother hid and waited. Soon, a huge elk came out. The youngest brother shot the elk four times to avenge each one of his brothers and killed it. Once he had skinned it, he realized the skin was too big, and so he threw it into the sky. And the stars that we see here represent the holes that the youngest brother put in the skin of the elk uh, that you can see now the light shining through as that skin has been stretched out and placed up in the nighttime sky. Now our Greeks also have quite a grisly tale with our grouping of stars and our queen Cassiopeia. Um, now this one does involve quite a few other characters as well. So let's introduce you to all of those. So we have our Queen Cassiopeia. Um, you can kind of picture this is her head, back, upper legs, lower legs, and big long feet. She's kind of sitting in her throne. And we're getting a side view, so she's kind of looking off this way. Up above our Queen sits this kind of square with a triangle attached to it. This is the throne of King Cepheus, and he is upside down right now, so his head is here, the arms, and the legs. Now, our queen and king were not very nice people at all. Um, they were quite horrible, actually, hated by the people that they ruled over, um, and also very vain. They were so proud of them as people, and especially proud of how beautiful their daughter is. So their daughter, we can find right next to the queen in this grouping of stars. And here is her head, her arms are outstretched, her body, and her legs. And this princess is named Andromeda. Now, the king and queen went so far as to declare that their dear daughter, the princess Andromeda, was the most beautiful being in the land. Even more beautiful than the gods and goddesses, which is not something you say unless you want some really ticked off gods and goddesses at your door. And guess what? That's exactly what happens. So the gods and goddesses come over and they're like, hey, um, you can't go around saying this but we'll let you make it up to us. Sacrifice your daughter, and we'll call it even. Well, I mentioned that, you know, the king and queen are not really nice people, so they were like, yeah, sure, let's sacrifice our daughter. We don't care. It doesn't hurt us. Yeah, not, not good people. Um, and so that's why our poor Andromeda has her arms outstretched. She is actually chained up to a giant rock in the middle of the ocean, waiting for the giant sea monster to come and eat her, and so she will be sacrificed to the gods and goddesses to make them happy. Well, luckily for Andromeda, 
our dear Perseus was flying by at that time. So Perseus is this group of stars right here below our queen. So we have his head, his body, legs, and then he has one arm outstretched because he is holding on to the head of Medusa. Medusa is, you know, the creature that if you look her in the eyes, she turns you to stone. And this is kind of Perseus's claim to fame. He's the guy who killed Medusa. And he is on his way back home with her head in a bag to prove that he actually did kill her. Uh, and to make his travels, he is actually traveling on one of my favorite mythical creatures, Pegasus, the winged horse, whose constellation takes a little bit of imagination. So it's these four stars right here. Yeah, it's a giant square. Um, this really goes to show you that just that the constellations usually don't look anything like they're supposed to. I'm still trying to figure out how the group Greeks got a winged horse from a square, but you know what? It's fine. It's a great story. So Perseus was flying back home on Pegasus after killing the Medusa, and he hears these cries from help and sees poor Andromeda chained on this rock in the middle of the ocean. And he turns and he looks and he sees the sea monster heading her way. And so he has to do a little bit of quick thinking. He wants to save the girl because, you know, that's what heroes do. But he doesn't want to die in the process. He's not okay with that type of hero story. And that's when he remembers that he has the head of Medusa. And so he pulls it out of the bag, being careful not to look at it himself, holds it up facing that sea monster, who unfortunately looks Medusa in the eyes, and it turns out her powers still work even when, you know, her head's chopped off, because the sea monster turns to stone and sinks down to the ocean floor. And so that allows Perseus to then fly down to free Andromeda, uh, and he, Andromeda, and Pegasus then fly off to live happily ever after. Except um, that's not quite the end of our story. We're not going to have a wonderful, happy ending for everyone. Because our Queen Cassiopeia and our King Cepheus have not made their sacrifice to the gods and goddesses now. And so the gods and goddesses are still very unhappy with them. And after some discussion, they decide to enact their final punishment by separating the king and queen, placing them up into the sky in a way that they will never be able to see or touch each other ever again, and locking them there for eternity. And that's why our dear queen is kind of looking off this way, and our king is looking out at us because they cannot see or touch each other ever again. Because that is the fate that comes to you when you tick off the Greek gods. It's just, it's what's going to happen. All right. So let's now head on over to the south, where high up in the sky, we have these three bright stars that make up the summer triangle. We have Vega, Deneb, and Altair. And we have a wonderful story about the constellations that um, encompass Vega and Altair. So Vega is in the constellation of Lyra the harp. So here's the harp body and the harp strings. And Altair is in Achilla the eagle. So we have the kind of teardrop shape of the eagle body, some wings, and some talons. So the harp Lyra was owned by a man, man named Orpheus, who was a very, very talented harp player. Uh, he would even play for the feasts that the gods would have. Well, unfortunately, one day... Um, Orpheus's wife passes away, and he is rightly very distraught by this, spends a lot of time in mourning, but the ladies in his village decided that a week was enough time. 
Enough time had passed he needed to get over his dead wife and marry one of them. So they all approach him, asking uh, for, you know, marriage, and he turns them all down because, I mean, it's been a week. He, he's not over his wife yet. He's still very much in love with her and in no way ready to settle down with someone new. Well, the ladies don't like this answer, and they take it out on him, I think, in a little bit of an extreme fashion. Um, they kill him and tear him limb from limb and scatter his limbs all across the countryside um, and throw his poor harp into the river. Um, so, yeah, that's the fate of our poor Orpheus. Um, now, our harp um, that Orpheus had ended up in the night sky because once Zeus learned of this horrific death of this very talented harp player, he sent his eagle Achilla down to fetch the harp uh, to place up in the sky to honor Orpheus. So a not really happy ending, but at least a honorable symbol from the gods, we'll say. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, now to we'll see our last few constellations. We are going to need to go a little bit later into the night. So I'm just going to speed up time here until some of our winter constellations are up in the eastern sky. All right, that looks good. So we are going to start off with stories about this little group of stars right here, which you may have heard as the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. Uh, now this is a little star cluster of actually couple thousand stars but there are six to seven that are very bright that you can see with your naked eye which is why the number seven tends to be very common in the stories about this little group of stars. So the first story about the Pleiades comes to us from the Sierra uh, and these groupings of stars are known as the Grizzly Sisters. So the Grizzly sisters used to always have fun playing with the Deer sisters. And they would go out and they'd play all the time, the Grizzly sisters and the Deer sisters, having a lot of fun, until one day, the Grizzly mother ate Deer mother. Yeah, I don't know, you know, you probably saw that one coming. But once this happened, the Deer sisters uh, were understandably very upset and decided that they could not risk being friends with the grizzly sisters anymore so they trapped the grizzly sisters in a cave and so this is the grizzly sisters cats trapped in the cave cave and then here are the deer sisters that are out just kind of playing in the field safe uh, on their own now that they have trapped the evil grizzly bears um, in Lithuanian folk tales, um, as well as Latvian folk songs, this grouping of stars is usually depicted as an inan inanimate object, um, a sieve which gets stolen by the devil from the thunder god, or is used to conjure light rain by thunder's wife and children. All right. Also up in the sky is... I would say one of the most famous and familiar constellations of the winter sky, our great hunter Orion. So we have his shoulders, his belt, his knees, a head. Um, we have an arm holding, you can either think of a, a bow and uh, um, some arrows, or this is a shield and a club. And then we have his legs coming down this way. Now Orion was 
very, very much in love with the goddess Artemis, who is the goddess of the hunt. So he decided that in order to show how much he loved Artemis, he was going to go to an island and hunt and kill every living thing on it. And so that's what he did. All through the night, he hunted and killed everything. By morning, there was this giant, grotesque pile of carcasses on the beach. And Artemis was not happy. She was quite disgusted by this. Because Artemis, while being the goddess of the hunt, only liked hunting for your needs for, you know, food or clothing or anything like that. You don't just hunt for sport. You hunt for, you know, items that you need. And so all of this senseless killing of living creatures, Artemis hated. And she hated Orion for doing this. And so she actually sent a small scorpion to pinch Orion's heel and kill him. And he did. Poor Orion died to the scorpion, which you can see up in the summer. It's the constellation Scorpio. Um, now, once Orion died, Artemis did start to feel a little bit guilty that maybe, maybe she went a little bit too far in her punishment. So she decided to put Orion up in the night sky um, as a kind of Maybe not apology, but a, hey, maybe I took this too far, so we'll stay up in the night sky, spend your night of stars. Um, but she also put the scorpion up in the night sky, too, uh, to thank him for doing what she had asked. But she was very careful about where she placed them. So Orion and the scorpion are on exact opposite sides of the sky. So that um, Orion is never up in the sky at the same time the scorpion is, so that Orion can never enact his revenge on the scorpion for killing him. All right, and we are going to end our star stories tonight with our two dogs that are in the sky. We have Canis Major. Um, now, there's a couple of different ways that you can see him. I kind of think of this really bright star as his eye. And so we have ears, mouth, he's kind of barking. And then um, coming down here, we have kind of some legs and then a body and then some legs back here. So we have one little dog right here. And then the second dog, Canis Minor, is right here. Yeah, it's two stars. Um, if you thought the square of Pegasus was bad, wait till you meet the stick of Canis Minor. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. We, we like to joke that it's, it's a wiener dog, just to kind of make it make sense. Um, and there are a, quite a lot of stories about these groups of stars that do actually depict them as dogs. Um, so to the Greeks, as I said, they're Canis Major and Canis, Major and Canis Minor, the big and little dog. Um, these are two dogs who guard the path to the land of the souls. And so to get past the dogs, you have to bring some food. You give food to the first dog, who will then let you pass, but you have to remember to save a little bit for the second dog, or else you're going to get trapped in between them. Uh, and you'll get trapped here forever, uh, right where that Milky Way passes right between them. Um, in Indian mythology, um, we again see these uh, groupings of stars depicted as dogs that guard um, the kind of path to the afterlife as well. Um, in Iranian mythology, again, we have a dog that uh, guards the uh, Chino oh, sorry, let me pronounce that right, Shinwat Bridge, which is the Milky Way. Um, this is the bridge that acts as the link between the world of um, our world and the realm of the dead. Um, and then in Norse mythology, Odin, who is the god of the dead and the afterlife in North, 
Norse mythology is accompanied by his two great wolves. And these two wolves continue to be kind of core icons in Northern Europe today. And so that is where we're going to end it with our guard dogs that are guarding that bridge or pathway to the afterlife that we started our show with. Um, so let me get switched back over. I hope you enjoyed our more spooky tales that are in our night sky. Um, if you are interested in some that are maybe a little bit more gruesome, a little bit more grisly, um, more PG-13, we'll say, we will be doing a show with that in a couple weeks um, with, you know, not quite as family friendly, getting, getting a little bit more gruesome, we'll say. That's pretty accurate, right, Eli? Yep. Yeah, that's the thing. A lot of these stories, especially Greek stories, are not, they, they, they need some censoring. <laughs> Right. So we're gonna do we're gonna do a um, older a APG thirteen show that gets into uh, more more of the real stories and less censored to be family friendly. Um, but we still hope you enjoyed these. Um, we did try to highlight stories from all different cultures since the Greeks are not the only ones that saw sto uh, pictures and told stories with the stars. Um, there's it's happened everywhere, and we like to be sure to include as much as we can in our star stories. Um, did we have any questions or anything come in, Eli? Uh, we had a couple pretty verbose commenters, um, but the only question that we got was, what about Sirius when you were talking about the um, the dogs? Yeah, so Sirius, here, I can bring that up, actually. Um, Sirius is this bright star that I mentioned, um, I see as the, the eye of the dog. Um, and that's why it's known as the dog star because it's in Canis Major, the dog constellation. Yeah, and that is the brightest star in the nighttime sky, actually, is Cirrus. So it's one that's very, very easy to see in the winter. All right, well, let me tell everyone a little bit about what's coming up over the next, um, over the rest of the month. Um, so we are in the midst of Spooktober. Um, on Wednesday of next week, we will be doing Beyond Bazaar, uh, talking about the kind of strange and weird things that we can find in the universe. Um, we are not going to be having a show next Saturday. We are taking that day off, uh, but then we will be back um, the next week with our regular Monday or sorry Wednesday Saturday schedule, and all of this Spooktober is leading up to Halloween Day, October thirty first, where we will be having Halloween outside the planetarium from three to five on Halloween Day. It's going to be a drive through experience where we will be passing out goodie bags with some fun activities that uh, are science but seem like magic. Uh, and um, candy as well, because I mean, it's Halloween. And then we're also going to be doing some uh, demonstrations that you'll be able to watch safely from your car, um, including testing what happens when we drop a pumpkin off the roof. And, you know, the name of science, of course. Um, I mean, what better way? What better way to test gravity than see what happens when you drop a pumpkin off the roof? Nope. <laughs> Nobody turned it off on Halloween. Huh? Make sure nobody turned it off on Halloween. Oh, yeah, exactly. Got to make sure. Yep. Um, so we're excited. Um, we know that, you know, uh, our normal Halloween event that we have had the past few years um, is not safe to do right now, but we hope that you will still come out and enjoy what we are able to do safely. Um, we're excited with the kind of fun activities we've put together um, and we hope you enjoy it. So um, with that, unless anything else came through, Eli? Just a couple of thank yous. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your Saturday and your weekend, and we will see you next time. Bye everyone.